Okay. So let's talk about small and large intestine pathology. Now, this is a very big topic. And under this, so many different pathologies we are going to talk about. So let's start with what are those topics which we are going to talk under this big heading. Intestinal obstruction to start with. Then we'll talk about malabsorption syndrome followed by inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Then diverticular disease, some congenital diverticulum or some acquired. And finally, we'll wrap this big topic with tumors of intestine discussion. Now, uh, in the beginning, we'll, we'll talk a small intestinal a normal structure. That is, what is the normal histology of small intestine. So anatomically, the small bowel having a length of around six meter in average includes the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. So it is average six meter long. And histologically, the small bowel is identified by the recognition of the villi. The only small bowel has got villi. Large bowel doesn't have villi. It's a very important point. And this villi has the function of absorption of food. Now, the wall of the small intestine consists of four layers. Serosa, muscularis propria, submucosa, and the mucosa. So we are coming from outwards towards the inwards. Now, serosa means peritoneum. If peritoneum has covered uh, that small intestine, which is called serosa, if it has not covered, we call that adventitia. Muscularis propria means the muscle layer, okay? The outer longitudinal and inner circular layer. In between these muscle layers, we have myenteric plexus. Now this myenteric plexus is also known as or back plexus, okay? Or back plexus. Myenteric plexus, also known as or back plexus. So let me write it here for you, or back plexus. or backs plexus good now what is the function of this or back plexus many students know the function is it stimulates the peristaltic movement from those muscles so that whatever content is inside the intestine it will propel or go downwards now inner to muscularis propria we have some mucosa now this sub mucosa is composed of loose fibrous tissue with a lot of blood vessels and lymphatics in it. The lymphatics has a special name here. We call it lactyls. And these lactyls, okay, has a very special function. Now, let's go back to our basic physiology. How the nutrients are getting absorbed. Remember, fat fat is absorbed into these lymphatics or lactyls and through the thoracic duct all this fat will ultimately reach the blood whereas carbohydrate and protein uh, they do not follow this way okay they are directly absorbed into the blood some mucosa has a missioner plexus okay it has missioner plexus this is another you know set of uh, ganglion cells which are present on the wall of the intestine, in this case, in submucosa. And in duodenum, especially in duodenum, uh, we have Brunner's gland. Now, this Brunner's gland secretes a lot of bicarbonate, and the function of this bicarbonate is to neutralize the acidic shine which is coming from the stomach. This function is very, very important. Now, mucosa, okay, the enormous layer has got three layers, epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis mucosa. Epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis mucosa. Now, epithelium is made up of tall columnar type of epithelium. The mucous membrane is thrown into different folds. We call them plica circularis, or simply plica, and the top of this plica or fold of mucous membrane is formed by villi. These villi are finger-like projections. 
or leaf like projection from the mucous membrane now this mucous membrane contains three different type of cells one is simple columnar cell which are relatively tall okay and in between in between they have crypts of liverkuhn which are deeper layer these are also known as intestinal gland which have a lot of different function goblet cells which are mucus producing cell are also in abundant amount and we have got endocrine cells okay they secrete some local gut hormone local gut hormone we say a few example i want to give you cck or cholecystokinin and secretin a cholecystokinin stimulate the gall bladder for the secretion of uh, for the secretion of bile of course and secretin it stimulate the pancreas okay real histological picture of small intestine so see there now see here okay let's come from outside this is the adventitia or cirrhosa if peritoneum has covered it we call it cirrhosa if peritoneum has not covered it we call it adventitia okay for example the posterior surface of duodenum is not covered by peritoneum it is a retroperitoneal structure so we call it adventitia there if i take example of ileum and jejunum there is cirrhosa now inner to that is a muscularis layer or muscularis propria outer longitudinal and inner circular outer longitudinal layer inner circular layer in between them okay one a uh, plexus is present which is called myenteric plexus or our backs plexus that that means there are nerve cells present now if i go still inner to that submucosa this submucosa has another type of plexus and that is called mishner plexus both of these are very important for the peristaltic movement as well as induction of secretion in the small intestine and the enormous layer is mucosa now mucosa also has three parts okay epithelium lamina propria and muscularis mucosa okay these are not uh, you know properly shown in this picture but this this elongated structure are plica circularis okay plica they are called now these are called intestine glands or crypts of liverkuhn look at this depressed area here okay Now, these are called plica and these tall structure at the roof are called villi these are villi finger like projections or leaf like structures now let's move on now with this background information let's talk about what is intestinal obstruction and what are the causes now look at the causes okay first i'll give one minute time for all of you please uh, look at the causes then i'll explain one one after other okay have a look there please okay now see here the intestinal obstruction means the bowel is obstructed there is no flow okay the flow inside the lumen of the intestine is blocked now there are two types of obstruction here mechanical obstruction and pseudo obstruction now let's talk one after other mechanical obstructions are caused by addition 
very very common cause addition means the two wall of the bowels are attached with each other so as a result of this the lumen is getting narrow and if some surgery was done before inside the abdomen okay a different example i can give you like laparotomy laparotomy means we open the peritoneal cavity appendectomy we remove the appendix cholecystectomy we remove the gall bladder all these are different name of the surgery so addition can occur very commonly another one is hernia okay hernia we all know what is hernia hernia is protrusion okay of a viscous uh, through the wall which contains it so that means uh, there are different uh, example here like inguinal hernia okay like femoral hernia incisional hernia umbilical hernia and diaphragmatic hernia different examples are there so roughly they can be internal hernia or external hernia the meaning is very simple internal they are occurring inside the abdominal cavity they are not coming outside and external means they are coming outside from some normal or abnormal opening now normal opening may be superficial or deep inguinal ring or femoral ring they are already there they are not abnormal structures but abnormal opening uh, means some incision now we have cut that wall so that will become abnormal opening now valvulus valvulus means twisting twisting of the bowel around one particular axis okay so it will definitely leads to obstruction but one other problem also occur along with obstruction it it will necrosis or that uh, part of the intestine can die because of ischemia so that is called valvulus obstruction with necrosis intussusception is a very interesting term that means the proximal bowel uh, is uh, going into the distal one all of these terms will discuss uh, one after other okay in the subsequent slide don't worry this is the introductory slide so i am telling you the meaning right now intussusception means the proximal segment of the bowel is going into the distal segment now let let me give you one example here if i go and talk about the iliocolic junction or iliocecal junction then if ilium is going into the cecum okay this is called intussusception now intussusception also has many problem one is intestinal obstruction and second is ischemia again now another cause of intestinal obstruction can be tumor okay those tumor can block the flow of the contents or they can uh, give pressure from outside outside the layer of intestine inflammatory stricture stricture means fibrosis and fibrosis will cause narrowing and this is caused by inflammation so different ulcer inside the intestine one of the important example we can give is tuberculous ulcer in case of okay gastrointestinal or intestinal tuberculosis another cause may be obstructive gallstone fecolith or foreign body obstructive gallstone fecolith or foreign body now let me highlight and show you see here obstructive gallstone fecolith and foreign body now one one important question here okay which will be always asked by your teacher how gallstone reaches ilium and can cause obstruction in iliocecal junction you can tell me that answer through bile sir yes into major duodenal cavity through by sir there will me because of fistula okay wait one by one okay wait 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 uh, okay uh now you can start yes can it move sir through bile okay zulfakar is saying through the bile okay another person sir uh, because of the fistula cool cystoduodenal fistula 
Okay, Abbas, Maybe right? Yes, you are Abbas, right? Yes. So Abba, Abbas, Abbas is saying, uh, for, first of all, there is a fistula formation between the gallbladder and the jejunum, and it will go distally. Any other answer? It's the same colitis, so entire fistula it will go through. Very good. Okay, so now listen carefully. Many of the students will confuse with this answer, okay? Because they think uh, the common bile duct is the natural passage for the stone. So it will go through there and reaches duodenum, and after that, distally. But remember one thing, the size of that stone is very, very small. The caliber or diameter of common bile duct is much smaller in comparison to the intestinal diameter. So, first of all, that stone will be very difficult to come out in the duodenum because there is a sphincter of OD present there. And second, even if it reaches there, it cannot cause intestinal obstruction because of the very small size. So the another pathway has to be there. And that is because of acute cholecystitis, okay, there is development of fistula between gallbladder and the intestine. And through that, even the large gallstone can pass directly into the intestine. And that is the cause of obstruction. This is a very important question. Now, fecal lip is a hard fecal matter. It almost acts like a stone, but in fact, it is not a stone. It is hard fecal matter. And foreign body, sometimes we may swallow certain substances, okay, which may block the flow of the intestine, like coins, okay, like all the other foreign body as well. Now, another may be congenital stricture or atresia. Congenital stricture or atresia. Now, what is the meaning? Now, stricture means narrowing. Okay, stricture means narrowing, and atresia means the that uh, part of the bowel is not uh, properly formed. Okay, so let me draw a small thing here. Okay, see here. Okay, just follow here. If the proximal part of the intestine is like this and distal part of the intestine is like this. Now there is no connection between these two segments. There is a clear cut gap. This is called atresia and this can clearly lead to intestinal obstruction because there is no continuity at all. Another cause may be congenital band which are you know already present there from the time of birth which may cause obstruction by encircling the intestine. Meconium. Now, what is meconium? First discharge uh, by the baby. Sir. Infants, sir. The first discharge, sir. Of okay. So, it is first intestinal discharge after the birth. First intestinal discharge first after the birth. Okay. So, it is not stool actually. Stool is having bacteria. Very strong from intestine. Exactly. Stool is having bacteria, but meconium doesn't have any bacteria. Meconium is sterile. That's the difference. Now, sometimes, even if I say it's after the birth, it is not always uh, true because sometimes the baby may pass meconium inside the uterus itself, okay, before the birth. So if you say it is the uh, intestinal discharge for the first time, you are right. Now, what I'm saying here is this meconium is sometimes very hard, okay? Very hard type of meconium. Now, what will what it will do there if it is hard meconium? It will not pass distally. So, as a result of this, it will block the lumen of the intestine. And one more is very interesting, uh, you know, condition known as imperforate anus. Now, there is no opening in the anal canal okay congenitally there is no opening now sometimes okay only the skin is separating now it is very easy type of condition for the surgeon you just you just cut it okay and everything will be fine sometimes it is quite deep and that time we, have, we will have a big problem now another type of uh, intestinal obstruction or pseudo obstruction now, pseudo obstruction means just analyze the meaning here. They can be caused by paralytic ileus, okay, 
and the important cause of paralytic ileus is post operative and hypokalemia hypokalemia and post operative another cause of pseudo obstruction is infarction of the bowel because of blockage of blood supply okay this is called ischemic bowel and third one horsprung's disease this horsprung's disease is absence of those ganglion cells which i just talked about you like myenteric plexus or mishner plexus if they are absent then horsprung's disease can happen so these are pseudo obstruction now what is the difference if somebody asks you what is the difference between mechanical obstruction and pseudo obstruction you can clearly answer that now, there is no true obstruction here okay the lumen of the bowel is not blocked but still there is no contraction going on the intestine cannot contract there is no peristaltic movement this is known as pseudo obstruction but clinically both of them look same because all of them classically have features of intestinal obstruction now what are those features of intestinal obstruction okay i'll i'll come to this picture a little bit later okay please have a look there these four cardinal features of intestinal obstruction they are abdominal pain abdominal pain okay let me highlight this abdominal pain and this abdominal pain is a colicky pain now colicky means comes and goes it is not a continuous type and this colicky pain is because of peristaltic movement of the intestine because peristalsis is not not continuous all the time you know it is intermittent type of contraction that's why abdominal pain is also colicky one second now the flow of the bowel is blocked okay so everything inside the bowel will be collected there now we are probably the person is eating person is drinking all that food contents is collected there probably all the gases okay remember when we breathe a lot of gas will go into our gi tract that will also be collected there our intestine is secreting a lot of fluid every day that is also collected there so this is called abdominal distension very very important point third constipation now if the intestine is blocked there will be no production of the fecal matter constipation and vomiting okay vomiting these four are important feature of intestinal obstruction if all four are there you don't need any other differential diagnosis you can say this is a case of intestinal obstruction let's find out the cause now this is how you need to solve that case let's let's go back okay uh, to the sorry to this picture okay now all of you please see, see look at this picture now now this is herniation now see see here why it is called herniation look at the segment of the bowel which is herniated outside this is called protrusion of the viscous through the wall which contains it now this is the wall of that cavity which is containing this loop of the intestine so this intestinal loop is herniated from this opening so this is hernia and two important hernia are shown here one is inguinal and another is umbilical this is called adhesion look here the wall the external surface of the bowel loop are connected with each other or they are adhered with each other and this is mainly a complication of previous surgery if some surgery is done inside the abdomen adhesion is very very common complication this is called intussusception now see here what is the problem here this is a proximal segment of the bowel okay sorry this is a proximal segment of the bowel and this is the distal segment this is the distal segment now this proximal segment is going towards the distal segment okay it is it is telescoping into the distal segment now what is the problem here 
So clearly, it will lead to intestinal obstruction, number one. And number two, whatever blood vessels supply this part of the intestine, now those blood vessels will be kinking, okay? They will be stretched. And as a result of this, this area will be ischemic now. This area will not get any blood supply. So it will die after a few hours or few days. And this is a major, major problem if this happens. And this uh, uh, important picture is volvulus. Look at the twisting of the bowel here. Okay, twisting of the bowel around one particular axis. And this area is already ischemic because it doesn't get enough blood supply. So these are the different picture which tells us the causes of intestinal obstruction. But today, I like to stop here. Okay, so let's start uh, today's class. So today we are going to talk about intestinal pathology. So this is a big topic and many pathologies are included under the same heading. So it takes time. So probably I'll take one more class regarding intestinal pathology. The first of them, which we have started from yesterday, the intestinal obstruction. Now, there are four classical features or cardinal features in intestinal obstruction. Those are abdominal pain, which is colicky in nature. Colicky means comes and goes. It's not a continuous type. And this abdominal pain is towards the umbilical area. It, it, it starts at the center of the abdomen. After that, we have abdominal distension. Abdominal distension means swelling of the abdomen. This occurs because the contents of the intestine are not going distally. So there is collection of the gas, okay? There is collection of intestinal content like some secretion, uh, food which the patient has eaten, all those things will make abdominal distension. Constipation, we all know what is constipation and vomiting. These all are very, very important features of intestinal obstruction. If all four are there, without any doubt, uh, uh, this is a case of intestinal obstruction, and then you need to find out the cause. Now, regarding the cause, one of the cause is hernia, okay, hernia. Now, a hernia is the protrusion of an organ, such as the bowel, or it may be omentum, bowel or omentum, or whatever through the wall of the cavity in which it normally resides or through the wall of the cavity which contains it. So anyway, uh, you can uh, present or answer, but the meaning should be there. So hernia is the protrusion of an organ such as the bowel through the wall of the cavity in which it normally resides. And this hernia usually occurs from a weak area, okay? For example, Peritoneal wall weakness or defect, it permits the protrusion of a peritoneal sac, which is called hernia sac, and inside that hernia sac, there is intestinal loop or omentum. The most important type of hernia is inguinal hernia, which we are going to talk a little bit into this class. Now, after knowing the definition of hernia, Let's talk about what is obstructed hernia. So sometimes what happens, the loop of the bowel, which has gone, okay, uh, which has gone inside that hernia sac, becomes imprisoned there. It cannot go back, okay? It will remain there. Even if we push, it doesn't go back. This is called obstructed hernia. So obstructed hernia is a cause of intestinal obstruction. And we need to go for surgery. We need to treat this patient by surgery. Then only patient will be all right. Now, there are two major factors which are involved in the formation of a hernia. Now, these two factors are important for all types of hernia actually, whether it is inguinal hernia, whether it's femoral, uh, incisional, umbilical, any of those type. So these are local weakness, which may be congenital, Local weakness, which may be congenital, that is at the umbilicus, inguinal and femoral, and in surgical scar, which is called incisional hernia. 
the surgical scar is acquired one, isn't it? We have done surgery later on. So incisional hernia is not occurring through the congenital weak area. So yesterday also I talked about these things. See there? So it may occur either through the local weakness, okay, or through the surgical scar. Another very, very important point is there is sustained increase in intra-abdominal pressure. Because of some reason, intra-abdominal pressure has to be high most of the time. And the common causes are constipation. Now remember this, if a person is constipated for a long time, while going to or defecate, the person is strained and that straining is an important cause of increased intra-abdominal pressure. Another is constant cough. This patient may be having some lung disease and as a result of that, the patient keep on coughing. That cough will cause increased intra-abdominal pressure and excessive exertion or excessive weight lifting, for example. A person uh, is not that strong, okay, but he is lifting a large you know, weight that also causes increased intra-abdominal pressure and suddenly hernia can happen. So these are the two major factors. Now, inguinal hernia are the most common one, followed by femoral and umbilical hernia. And even incisional hernia occurs commonly these days. Now, inguinal hernia uh, are of two types. Direct inguinal hernia and indirect inguinal hernia. Okay? direct and indirect inguinal hernia now before i go into the uh, you know different types of these uh, direct and indirect inguinal hernia you should know one very important anatomy that is hessel back triangle okay so let's uh, anybody know what is hessel back triangle yes no sir okay, inferior okay. mesenteric heart uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, go on. It's a triangle between the inferior mesenteric artery mm -hmm. and inguinal canal mm -hmm. and uh, our uh, rectus muscle. Okay. Any, any, uh, anybody else? Yes. Sir, it has got three borders. Sir, the medial border is the lateral margin of the rectus sheath. Uh, mm -hmm. The superolateral border is the inferior uh, epigastric vessel. And sir, mm -hmm. the inferior border is the inguinal ligament, sometimes called as a popart ligament. Okay, okay. One more answer I want. Anybody? Any other student? Okay, so let me let me answer. Okay, good. The students who, who have answered. Okay, so listen carefully because I cannot ask all the students here. This Hesselbeck triangle has three boundaries. Triangle always has three boundaries. Now the medial, the medial boundaries is formed by lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle okay lateral border is formed by inferior epigastric vessels inferior epigastric vessels both artery and vein are there and the inferior border is formed by inguinal ligament inferior border is formed by inguinal ligament uh right it is called pauper's ligament as well and the, so there is no superior border because it's a triangle, isn't it? Oh, those are two edges are fused together now. So there are the three boundaries of SL back triangle. Now, let me write that term for you. Maybe students want to know about this. Okay. This is Hessel back triangle. Hessel back triangle. Now, why I am bringing this point here? There is a meaning. Through this Hesselbeck triangle, direct inguinal hernia appears. Okay, through this Hesselbeck triangle, direct hernia, her, direct inguinal hernia appears, and it comes out through the external inguinal or external abdominal ring. Whereas indirect hernia, it follows the inguinal canal. That means it enters through the deep inguinal ring. It travels into the inguinal canal. It comes out through the superficial inguinal ring. And of course, the deep inguinal ring is okay, lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. So one, one point still, which makes it very easy for you, 
direct hernia is from medial to the inferior epigastric artery whereas indirect hernia appears lateral to the inferior epigastric artery never forget this even anatomy teacher or whoever you know any surgical teacher would love to ask this question okay so let's move on now when the content of the hernia such as loop of intestine can be returned to the abdominal cavity okay we call that reducible hernia reducible it is going back sometimes on its own uh, and sometimes we have to push it but when it is not going back we call it irreducible hernia sometimes there is addition development inside the hernial sac and it is attaching there you know it doesn't go back even by pushing it doesn't go back it is called irreducible hernia and this irreducible hernia can lead to intestinal obstruction now the two common complications of hernia any type of hernia intestinal obstruction now we are talking about inguinal hernia so let's make that as our point of reference intestinal obstruction another is strangulation now this strangulated hernia or strangulation means the blood supply to the wall of the intestine is cut off okay it has suffered from ischemia and now that part of the intestine died so strangulated hernia is a very very common problem so two important complication intestinal obstruction and strangulation of the hernia now after going through this let's talk about addition what do you mean by that addition means the localized peritoneal inflammation which leads to formation of fibrosis this fibrosis leads to fibrous bridging between the different please do not do not talk do not do not talk here please mute mute yourself because everybody can hear yeah. what you mute yourself so i'm talking about addition this means there is a fibrous bridging uh, or bridges formation between viscera or two loops of the intestine uh, for that example and it usually follows surgery any surgery inside the abdomen like laparotomy we call that laparotomy when we open the peritoneal cavity for major type of surgery infection like appendicitis for example cholecystitis for example and any radiation exposure can also lead to inflammation and then fibrosis so that is the cause of addition now this addition can lead to internal herniation because there is a small opening you know when those those or uh, two loops of the bowels are attached and through that internal herniation can occur obstruction is a very common complication of addition that's what we are talking it here we are talking about intestinal obstruction now and even strangulation because of lack of blood supply can happen now i'm again showing you the same picture which we discussed yesterday this is the herniation or hernia okay see here this is hernial sac and the herniation is occurring through the through the weak area this is the addition which we are talking right now the two loops of the bowel are fused with each other through fibrous septa or fibrous bridge so this is addition now another important cause of intestinal obstruction is intussusception intussusception now what do you mean by that it is a telescoping of a proximal segment of the bowel into the distal one okay now let me use a pointer because most of the students have come now so telescoping of a proximal segment of the bowel into the distal segment that means the proximal segment is going into the distal segment okay let me give one example right now Uh, if i take the example of ileocecal region ileum if it goes into the cecum and even distal to that this is the perfect example of intussusception now in this case 
the telescoped segment is called intersusceptum and the receiving segment is called intersusceptions because one one segment is going into the other remember one segment which has gone downwards is called intersusceptum and other which is receiving it is called intersusceptions so this is a very important one now this uh, intersusception is more common in infants and children than in the ad adults and in adults it if it occurs if it is not common i just now told you if it occurs then it may be associated with a mass or tumor which is present inside the lumen of the intestine that mass or tumor may act like a gravitational force which will pull the upper segment into the lower one this is the mechanism now regarding okay regarding the presentation how this uh, intersusception uh, presents it causes intestinal obstruction abdominal pain and one very very important point it it has blood in the stool okay and a bit of mucoid in nature we call that current jelly stool okay we call that current jelly stool so let me uh, highlight this or underline i should say this current jelly stool is a very important feature of intersusception now let me give you a clinical example a 2 year old child okay 2 year old child is constantly crying for 2 hours and parents don't know what to do that child is drawing both his legs up towards the abdomen and crying vigorously with a lot of sweating now meanwhile the child also passes this current jelly type of stools and the parents are very worried so they run towards the hospital with that child the doctor examine and the doctor give this diagnosis as intersusception so this is how intersusception present now, what is the complication of this now, two important problem occurs here one is obstruction okay obstruction has already occurred but if the treatment is late that segment which has gone inside will suffer from infarction now why infarction occurs is very easy to understand remember when the proximal segment is telescoping into the distal one it will drag blood vessels along with it and those blood vessels cannot be stretched further so they will suffer some damage which leads to ischemia and ischemia leads to infarction of that intersusceptive segment okay so let's go to another slide now now see this picture okay it will uh, explain uh, the whole mechanism very easily for you so this is intersusceptum so this is a proximal segment look at here this is the proximal segment and this is the distal segment this is the distal segment which is called intersusceptions so this proximal segment is going dist into distal segment it is telescoping we say it is going distally and distally so when it does that look at these blood vessels they are stretched okay so after some time after some time they will develop ischemia and infarction ischemia and infarction and this black area which you can see here is the infarcted area so this is called intersusception now one small point okay uh for the treatment of intersusception if the baby comes a little bit early okay this this area is not uh, uh, ischemic or not infarcted treatment is quite easier we just push the segment which has gone distally okay by hydrotherapy it is called hydrotherapy you give water or or a water under pressure through the rectal root which will push the proximal segment upwards and if it is late we have to open the abdomen and do laparotomy and remove the dead segment of the intestine that is a very complicated type of surgery 
Now, after this, let's talk about one of the important, uh, you know, uh, type of disease known as Hirschsprung disease. Okay, it is pronounced as Hirschsprung disease. So let's talk about this. Now, this Hirschsprung disease is a congenital aganglionic megacolon. This is a very, very common or highly informative synonymous term. It is a congenital condition, may present right from the birth, and it is caused by lack of the ganglion cells. Lack of the ganglion cells in the colon. Colon means large intestine. Colon means large intestine. So, one part of the colon is not having ganglion cells. Now, in yesterday's class, when we talk about the histology of intestine, I clearly told you there are two, two types of knob plexus present on the wall of the intestine. One is called or back plexus, which is present between the longitudinal and circular muscle, and that is outside. And one is Mishner plexus, which is present in the submucosal area. Now, these are also known as ganglion cells. If they are absent in one particular segment of the intestine, that segment cannot contract or cannot work. Okay, so if you remember this, it will be very easy for me to explain the remaining things. Now, see here, there is a congenital absence of the ganglion cells, mainly in the rectum and sigmoid colon resulting in intestinal obstruction. Now, you may ask question to yourself, what happens if these ganglion cells are absent in rectum or a small part of the sigmoid colon? That part cannot have peristaltic movement. It acts like a constricted segment. Okay? Please uh, mute yourself. All of you mute yourself. When I had mute corona, yaar. Okay, so I have muted all of you. Okay, so if, if any discussion, we'll do at the end now because it is causing a lot of problem here. Now, see this. Let me explain again. So, when this ganglion cell is absent in the rectum and sigmoid colon, that part of the intestine cannot have peristaltic movement. So, it behaves like a segment of intestinal obstruction. Now, above, above or proximal to that segment, the whole intestine will be dilated because it still has peristaltic movement, it still can contract, and it still want to push all the contents distally. But that cannot happen, isn't it? Because one particular segment is lacking the ganglion cell. It cannot contract or cannot show peristaltic movement. Now, the area which is distally to that absent you know, segment will remain collapse because nothing is passing there. This is a very, very important point in case of Hirschsprung's disease. Now, it is a result of defective neural crest cell migration from the cecum to the rectum because these ganglion cells, they are developed from neural crest cell. These neural crest cells, remember, they are from the central nervous system. Now, how the baby present or what are the clinical features? This is more common in male baby than in female baby. And in this case, okay, there is delayed passage of meconium. Now, meconium is the first intestinal discharge from the baby. So, even after 24 to 48 hours, the baby doesn't pass meconium. Now, it is a very worrisome point because meconium should be passed within 24 hours. If the baby doesn't pass, then we are worried. But in this case, how the baby pass meconium, isn't it? There is obstruction there. So this is one of the very common presentation. Now, constipation is there, okay? Abdominal distension is there, and vomiting is there. All of these are features of intestinal obstruction. And it is very commonly associated with Down syndrome. And Down syndrome means trisomy 21. One of the common features is Hirschsprung's disease. 
Now, regarding the gross uh, features and microscopic features, this gross features means the affected segment is narrowed. Okay? The affected segment is mainly present in the cecum, sorry, in the sigmoid colon or rectum, sigmoid colon or rectum, okay, that is most commonly affected. And the proximal segment means the segment which is in front to that is dilated. So we call that megacolon. That's why the first, first uh, you know, sentence which we discuss, congenital aganglionic megacolon is a very good term for the description of Hirschsprung's disease. Now, if we take biopsy from that affected segment, then there will be absence of the ganglion cells in our back plexus and Mishner plexus. I've already explained this to you. Our back plexus is also known as myenteric plexus, which is present between the muscles, means longitudinal and transverse muscle, a circular muscle, I should say, and Mishner plexus is present in the submucosa. Both are absent. Now, let's go to the next slide. Now, see here. See here how it, how it looks. This is a ganglionic okay, part. What does that mean? There are no ganglion cells present. There is absence of the ganglion cell. Ganglion cells mean nerve cells. See this? You cannot see this type of cell. These are called ganglion cells. Where are the ganglion cells here? They are absent. Okay. So this is the proximal segment, which is normal. Proximal segment, which is normal. And this is dilated because it is normally behaving. But the distal segment, okay? This is the affected segment, segment of course. And if a distal segment is still present, then, then that, it is collapse or the narrow. This is very, very important feature of Hirschsprung's disease. Now, this is a real patient picture. The first one is called preoperative barium enema. Preoperative barium enema. Now see this? There is one tube which is inserted into the rectum and they are pushed barium through this tube. So this barium has filled the whole area. Okay? Now in this area, in this area, it is dilated and this area is contracted. So this is one of the very important a radiological finding and another one this is a intraoperative appearance of the dilated sigmoid colon so this is usually dilated see that and that what happens because this is a proximal segment and probably here is the obstruction and this is the distal segment which is collapsed now on a small information here how do you uh, uh, treat a case of Hirschsprung's disease, okay? Uh, the treatment is done by surgery. The treatment is done by surgery. And those surgery should be in a stepwise fashion. Now, first of all, I'll give you a little bit, uh, you know, knowledge here because it is very interesting. First of all, uh, this proximal colon or proximal segment is usually dilated. So what the surgeon will do Okay, they will put one colostomy tube, or I should say, one segment of the bowel is stitched to the wall of the abdomen so that all the stool will go out from there. Okay, they will give time for this dilated segment to settle down. We cannot do surgery if this segment is so much dilated. So after stool passes from here, over a period of time, this segment will come back to its normal. Then the proper surgery is done. That means they resect that affected segment and do end-to-end -end anastomosis. End-to-end -end anastomosis means they rejoin the segment of the bowel again so that everything will be all right. So they will do surgery in different stages. Uh, once all the surgery can, uh, is not possible in Hirschsprung's disease. Now, after doing this Hirschsprung's disease, very, very interesting part, let's go to the malabsorption syndrome. Now, in the beginning, 
let me tell you what do you mean by malabsorption now malabsorption means faulty absorption the proper absorption is not happening inside our intestine now food absorption occur only from the small intestine so there is some problem there in jejunum and ileum as a result of that food absorption is not happening this is called malabsorption so there are so many causes for this let's talk one after other the first group of causes would be because of defective intraluminal digestion okay defective intraluminal digestion now let's talk about it this is because of pancreatic insufficiency now what do you mean by that now our pancreas has two parts exocrine part and endocrine part now endocrine part doesn't have any connection now okay let's forget about it we are bothering about only exocrine because it is secreting enzymes and these enzymes play very active role in digestion of the food now if food are not digested they are not absorbed so this is a very simple logic so pancreatic insufficiency or pancreatic failure because of pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis can lead to malabsorption very very common cause remember the disease cystic fibrosis it's a genetic disease where exocrine glands are mainly involved now having said that let me directly take those names lung is one of the organ which is very badly damaged liver is another one and pancreas is another one so these three organs are very badly damaged in cystic fibrosis if pancreas is damaged then no enzyme can be secreted without those enzyme like lipase amylase trypsin chymotrypsin food absorption cannot occur or digestion cannot occur leading to malabsorption another is jollinger ellison syndrome jollinger ellison syndrome this means there is a tumor inside the pancreas okay tumor inside the pancreas and this tumor is secreting gastrin hormone gastrin now we all know what is the effect of gastrin in the stomach it increases hydrochloric acid secretion now your answer is very easy now because of excessive secretion of hcl or hydrochloric acid all that acid will come towards the duodenum okay duodenum now it will it it is not you know uh for example what is there in duodenum which will neutralize the acid yesterday many students talked about that isn't it like a brunner gland secretions would be there bile would be there and all those things but if acid is excessive okay if acid is excessive then inactivation of that acid is not possible now what will happen all those enzyme which are coming from pancreas they will be destroyed or inactivated by that acid this is a very important mechanism and malabsorption can occur so that's why it is written very directly here with inactivation of pancreatic enzyme by excessive gastric acid secretion this is the mechanism of malabsorption in jollinger ellison syndrome another uh, cause of defective intraluminal digestion can be ileal dysfunction or resection okay and the important mechanism here is decrease bile salt uptake fat for fat absorption we need bile so probably a fat malabsorption can occur now if bile is not coming at all okay if bile is not coming at all into the second part of the duodenum because of obstruction of the common bile duct or if the liver is not producing bile which can happen then also there will be fat malabsorption probably other nutrients will not have any problem but fat cannot be absorbed and bacterial overgrowth inside the intestine it can happen which will result in degradation of food okay degradation of food and also there will be malabsorption now other causes would be primary mucosal cell abnormality now some 
uh, some of the epithelial cells or most of the epithelial cell present in the intestines are not functioning well or some of the enzyme which are present there are lacking so these are the reasons you can give like defective terminal digestion when there is disaccharidase deficiency this disaccharidase okay one of the example is lactase now remember the example of uh, uh, disaccharide okay i have already unmuted you so can can somebody tell me what are the example of disaccharide yes yes guys glucose fructose and sucrose sucrose glucose okay sucrose okay wait 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 i i'll choose some of the yes junaid what is your answer sucrose glucose fructose okay so these are disaccharide anybody sucrose. else any other student yes galactose yes sir yes sir Yes, sir. Sucrose, lactose, lactose, lactose. Wait, wait, wait. One by one. Yes, Irfan. Yes. Sir, disaccharides are sucrose, maltose, and lactose. Okay, sucrose, maltose, and lactose. Yes, Adnan Sabdar. What is your answer? Sucrose, lactose, maltose. Very good. Okay, so same answer. So both of them are absolutely correct. okay so this is a important question we like to ask you please listen again the important disaccharides are three okay maltose sucrose and lactose and important monosaccharide you have to remember the monosaccharide also otherwise you will quickly forget about it okay so let's start freshly after the break we are talking about causes of Uh, malabsorption and these are the two important headings under which we talk so many different conditions like defective intraluminal digestion which can uh, occur because of pancreatic insufficiency jollinger ellison syndrome ileal dysfunction or resection cessation or stoppage of bile flow and bacterial overgrowth second heading would be primary mucosal cell abnormality okay which can occur because of disaccharides deficiency and i was asking some of the students about different examples of disaccharide and monosaccharide okay now uh, you have answered it very correctly the examples of disaccharides would be maltose lactose and sucrose but at the same time examples of monosaccharide also has to be known these are glucose okay glucose fructose and galactose glucose fructose and galactose these are monosaccharide now let's uh, talk about uh, some other causes of malabsorption look at the list here reduce small intestinal surface area and it occurs due to glutton sensitive enteropathy which is also known as celiac disease and crohn's disease so let me explain this a little bit more now in our uh, intestine especially in jejunum and ileum there are villi those villi increase the surface area or increase the site of absorption of food if those villi are damaged okay then the absorption site would be reduced this is exactly what happens in celiac disease these villi are badly damaged this is a condition which we we are going to talk in today's class now crohn's disease is a type of inflammatory bowel disease which involves the whole of the gi tract so it can affect those villi as well and can result in malabsorption especially it happens in ileal part now lymphatic obstruction okay lymphatic obstruction can also lead to uh, malabsorption and the common disorders can be lymphoma as well as tuberculosis and tuberculous lymphadenitis now what may be the reason okay let's talk a little bit about it remember if those lymph flow are obstructed there then there is always congestion okay of the lymph or i should say there is always the collection of lymph on the mucosal area and the absorption would not be proper infection 
is another cause of malabsorption like acute infectious enteritis okay enteritis means inflammation of the intestine parasitic infestation okay? like roundworm for example tropical sprue this is just like celiac disease where the uh, enteropathy is uh, because of infection in celiac disease this is glutton sensitive enteropathy a type of autoimmune disease whereas tropical sprue is caused by infection and one other condition known as whipple's disease is caused by trophorema whipelli it's the name of the bacteria okay uh, some of the information we are going to talk now another cause of malabsorption may be iatrogenic iatrogenic means surgeon or doctor induced now just think of a situation here because of some reason if there is subtotal or total gastrectomy done and one of the good indication is carcinoma of the stomach we need to remove that part of the stomach this is called subtotal or even total gastrectomy now all the functions of stomach is gone okay and stomach has very different sorry very important function regarding food absorption the bigger food particle will be churned into a smaller food particle by stomach so that function is gone so we we will have major problem and one other reason i can give the parietal cells of the stomach secrete two important substance one is hcl and another is yes what is that another substance which is secreted by parietal cells intrinsic factor very good excellent okay so many students know this this is intrinsic factor now without intrinsic factor vitamin b12 cannot be absorbed so that is another reason you can give very uh, correctly here now what i am saying here is because of some disorders like ischemic bowel ischemic bowel or infarction of the bowel we need to remove that part of the bowel if that ischemia or infarction occurs in small intestine for example in jejunum and ileum and if we need to remove it now think of a consequence here now from where the food is going to be absorbed we are in big big trouble this is known as short gut syndrome okay short gut syndrome so in that situation whatever we eat or whatever we take can quickly go towards the large intestine and we can suffer from diarrhea so this is called short gut syndrome now some of the picture okay let's discuss uh, quickly now see here this is a normal villi okay. this is a normal villi they are leaf like or finger like projection from the mucosa of the intestine mainly jejunum and ileum now in this case there is partial villus atrophy okay they become see this the height becomes short now okay and they become wider so the, these are the perfect one these are the normal one in comparison to this this have short height as well as broader and you may ask question why this is happening look at the collection of plasma cell here so inflammation is going on some sort of chronic inflammation and this is causing the damage to the villi so another picture okay sub total villus atrophy i cannot see those elevation now so this slight amount of elevation can be seen here and there but in comparison to this or even this this almost look flat and food cannot be absorbed from this type of intestine so with this uh, discussion let's talk about celiac disease now one of the very important part of malabsorption now celiac disease is also known as glutton sensitive enteropathy okay glutton sensitive enteropathy now glutton is a type of protein now what do you mean by sensitive somebody is allergic to glutton that's the meaning of sensitive so people who are allergic to glutton okay, can have okay damage of villi inside their intestine leading to malabsorption 
and this is known as celiac disease. It has got some other terms. It is also known as non-tropical sprue or idiopathic steatorrhea. Non-tropical sprue or idiopathic steatorrhea, which are not very common term. The commonest term is glutton sensitive enteropathy and celiac disease. Okay. Now let's talk uh, in detail about this. Now what is happening here? Listen carefully. This is very interesting condition. Now some of the people they are already genetically predisposed. Not, not all of us. Uh, when we take glutton containing food, we suffer from malabsorption or diarrhea. Only those people suffer who are genetically predisposed. Now these genetically predisposed people have HLA-B8, DR3, and DQ inside them. So what does that mean? They are already predisposed. On top of that, if they take these glutton-containing food or grain like wheat, barley, and rye, okay, then they have celiac disease. This is the way to remember. We normal healthy people, we are not genetically predisposed to have celiac disease. We can eat whatever we want. We don't suffer from any malabsorption. Only those people who are genetically predisposed will have celiac disease. Now, this is considered a, a type of autoimmune disease. Now, this glutton have a, even a smaller type of protein in them, which is called gliadin. Okay? This gliadin acts as an antigen here. This antigen is picked by antigen presenting cell and presented to the T cell. Now T cell will be activated and the whole immune system will be active in that part of the intestine. Now what will happen? It will recruit different type of other inflammatory cells. It will release different cytokine. It will form different autoantibody and then the disease will occur. So in short, we can say Genetic predisposition is, is important. Autoimmunity play an important role. And glutton sensitivity is also necessary. Now, what are these serum antibodies here? They are IgA anti-gliadin and IgA anti-endomycial antibody. IgG antibodies are also there. So anti-gliadin and anti-endomycial antibody. Now, it has another name also in some of the textbook. It is known as NC anti transglutaminase antibody. Okay. Anti tissue transglutaminase antibody is also written. Now, as a pathology student, uh, you should know what are the microscopic features of that part of the intestine which have suffered from celiac disease. If we take a biopsy from there and study under the microscope, you can see loss of the villi. That's why there is malabsorption. This is an autoimmune disease. So inflammation is going on there. So there are lots of intraepithelial lymphocyte collection. As well as there is increased plasma cell in the lamina propria. Remember, our mucosa in the intestine has three parts. Epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis mucosa. So intraepithelial lymphocyte and plasma cell in the lamina propria are important for feature of celiac disease. Okay. Okay. Now see there. Okay. Now see this. Restore. Okay. Now see here. These are uh, some of the uh, histopathological slide of celiac disease. There is partial villus atrophy and there is subtotal villus atrophy. Uh, a little while earlier, you have seen schematic diagram, but this is a real histopathological diagram. You can see here, okay, there is shortening and blunting of the villi. Okay? Their height is reduced in comparison to the normal. We have seen how normal thing looks and this is almost flat with lots of inflammatory cells deposition. Look at these blue dots there, okay? These are the inflammatory cells. This is a chronic sort of disease. So these cells are either lymphocyte or plasma cell. Now, 
what is the presentation of celiac disease what are the clinical features let's talk about it now the disease usually presents in the childhood with all these features the child presents with malabsorption and we all know what is the cause of malabsorption now when there are no villi from where the food will absorb and without the absorption that food will go distally now distally means towards the colon distally means towards the colon and in the colon okay in the colon there are normal flora present now those normal flora will degrade this food the bigger food particles or molecules will be degraded during that time gases will be formed the, during that time some liquid will also be will also be coming out so all these things are responsible for clinical features in celiac disease if you remember like that everything will be very easy for you okay now see here so malabsorption there's no need to explain here now abdominal distension because of a lot of gas formation there bloating again because of gases flatulence is also because of gas diarrhea okay because of that osmotically active food particle going downwards they will draw a lot of fluid inside the lumen of the intestine that is one point another because of the action of this normal flora okay the liquid component will be liberated there so all these are important causes of diarrhea steatorrhea one of the very very important term that means we are losing fat in the stool fat containing stool is called steatorrhea now why fat is present in the stool the, the answer is very easy because it is not absorbed okay once it is not absorbed it will be excreted in the stool that is called steatorrhea now some of the important you know practical point i like to share with you here now when we take the history from our patient we cannot ask hey do you have steatorrhea we cannot ask that question isn't it our patient don't understand what is steatorrhea so we need to know how that stool looks like so steatorrhea stool is greasy okay greasy or oily because there is lot of fat present there it is sticky and it is very foul smelling greasy oily sticky and foul smelling stool and one more point the bulk of the stool is also more means it is bulky type of stool so if you ask question like that then patient can give you the proper answer then you already know yes this patient is having steatorrhea now i need to find some more clinical features because of chronic malabsorption the person will lose weight person will lose weight very important feature of celiac disease now there is one component of celiac disease which can cause a lot of problem on our skin this is called dermatitis herpetiformis dermatitis herpetiformis now dermatitis means inflammation of the skin because dermis is a part of the skin herpetiformis means there are formation of some blisters vesicle which almost looks like herpes virus infection but remember this is not caused by herpes virus this is also autoimmune type of disorder it is known as dermatitis herpetiformis so it is a skin manifestation of celiac disease and here blisters are formed on the skin now let's move on what do you mean by a tropical sprue okay what is tropical sprue there a tropical sprue means it is almost similar to celiac disease but the cause is not autoimmunity the cause is infection so this is the way we describe it so it is a malabsorptive disease of unknown etiology malabsorptive disease of unknown etiology that means 
uh, this is a speculation they have not proven actually but but mostly it is caused by infection and sometimes it is caused by nutritional deficiency also which mainly occur in those travelers who travel to the tropical regions or tropical countries like caribbean south american countries and even in uh, south asia like india and even sri lanka okay so if somebody is traveling there when they return they may suffer from tropical sprue now what is the difference between tropical sprue microscopy and celiac disease microscopy there is no difference whatsoever see this it is almost the same loss of villi increase intra epithelial lymphocyte as well as increase plasma cell in the lamina propria which is the same one but cause and pathogenesis is different now another uh, you know type of malabsorption or another cause of malabsorption is whipple disease what is this whipple disease let's talk about it now whipple disease is caused by one particular bacteria the name of this bacteria is called trophorema whipelli trophorema whipelli it is gram positive bacteria and this infection is not very common this is a rare infectious disease which involve many organ of our body okay like small intestine that's what we are talking right now even the joint lung heart liver spleen and even the central nervous system so multiple organs of our body are affected by whipple disease the most common uh, you know race is caucasian race that means white people are affected and the common age group is between 30 to 50 years now what is the presentation or clinical feature of whipple disease it leads to malabsorption weight loss and diarrhea malabsorption leads to chronic diarrhea and there will be weight loss now how you confirm the diagnosis you need to take biopsy from those affected area mainly the intestine and if you do that the small bowel lamina propria is filled with macrophages these are the chronic inflammatory cells which are stuffed with pas positive rod shaped bacilli pas positive rod shaped bacilli are present inside the macrophages in increase amount now this is per iodic acid sieve stain per iodic acid sieve stain so this per iodic acid sieve stain is positive in this particular type of bacteria so this will give us the diagnosis okay now after this uh, without wasting any time let me uh, start the second part of this intestinal pathology because i have divided into two parts just to uh, make it easier for you okay let's continue another important disease which we are going to talk is inflammatory bowel disease very important part of intestinal pathology uh, if a question comes from this intestinal pathology and some question will definitely come in your exam there is no doubt about it okay that's why i am revising it now uh, this is one of the major area now inflammatory bowel disease are of three major type crohn's disease ulcerative colitis and colitis of indeterminate type but in many textbook the last one okay is not even included so you can safely say there are two major types of inflammatory bowel disease okay that is absolutely correct answer crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis now crohn's disease is also known as regional enteritis because the terminal part of the ileum is most commonly affected in crohn's disease now let's talk something more about them both of these disorder okay this crohn's disease as well as ulcerative colitis primarily affect the bowel or intestine but may have systemic involvement as well okay like polyarthritis poly means multiple arthritis is inflammation of the joint so multiple joints may be inflamed uveitis now uveitis means 
inflammation of the uvea uvea is one of the layer of our eyeball onchylogenic spondylitis is inflammation of the vertebra along with sacroiliac joint skin lesions okay one of the skin lesion example i can give here is erythema nodosum erythema nodosum which can occur in the lower limb in front of the tibia they are painful skin lesion and even the liver can be badly affected these are called extra intestinal manifestation of inflammatory bowel disease okay extra intestinal manifestation because these occur outside the intestine and probably after few slide we are going to repeat some of the important things once again now regarding the epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease females are more commonly affected than the male and how i remember this fact there is one clue for you this is also considered a type of autoimmune disease or immunologically mediated condition and many of them are very common in female okay so this works for many disease more common in caucasians than non caucasians means white people are more commonly affected than non white people and related to the age distribution crohn's disease cd means crohn's disease okay it is bimodal that means it peaks at the age of 10 to 30 and then 50 to 70 so 10 to 30 years there's one peak or very common affection in this age group and 50 to 70 there will be another peak whereas ulcerative colitis occur in young people okay it peaks at the age of 20 to 30 years so this is about the uh, age distribution for inflammatory bowel disease now before i move on to the clinical features discussion let's talk about pathophysiology how this disease occur what are the mechanism now actually speaking these all are hypothesis we really do not know what is the real pathophysiology so these are hypothesized etiology of inflammatory bowel disease so one of them is persistent infection inside the bowel that may be caused by mycobacteria that may be caused by helicobacter species both of these are bacteria now that may be caused by measles and mumps okay this is a virus now may be caused by listeria monocytosan it is also a type of bacteria and it may be caused by toxigenic strain of the e coli also a bacteria so this is one of the hypothesis now another hypothesis tells us there is a dysbiosis dysbiosis means there is no balance between protective bacteria and aggressive commensal now inside our intestine there is a nice balance most of the time between these two types of organism some of them are protective for us and some are aggressive commensal so if there is decrease protective bacteria and increase number of aggressive commensal they can themselves cause the damage that is another important hypothesis the third one is a defective mucosal integrity now the mucosa is not normal or it is damaged okay not normal or damaged it may be uh, secreting alter type of mucus or decreased mucus there may be increased permeability through the wall of those epithelium or mucosa there may be cellular starvation means they are slowly you know decreasing or dying away and there may be a uh, impaired restitution this means regeneration the regeneration of mucosal or epithelial tissue is getting impaired and the last one there is dysregulated immune response now that means there may be loss of tolerance now this tolerance is a very important feature of our immune system it will not attack our own body cells it can identify which is self and which is foreign if this property is lost then our own body cells or tissues can be damaged this is called loss of tolerance 
this is one of the very important mechanism in autoimmune disease now another one is aggressive cellular activation okay and third one is a defective apoptosis now apoptosis most of the students know you have studied in pathology this is a program type of cell death it is it is caused by genetic programming it is already there it is already predetermined which type of cells are going to die and which type of cells are going to survive but the process is activated by certain bacteria certain viruses and certain other stimuli so we have talked a lot of things about this pathophysiology or hypothesis etiology let me summarize this in one sentence the proper pathophysiology is not known these all are different hypotheses and they say there may be a role of persistent infection by different microorganism there may be a role of increased amount of aggressive commensals there may be a role of defective mucosal integrity and there may be a role of dysregulated immune response in the causation of inflammatory bowel disease okay now let's move further now let's talk about the clinical features or presentation of inflammatory bowel disease now though we say there are three types but uh, you know practically we talk about only two of them ulcerative colitis and crohn's disease so ulcerative colitis is more common than crohn's disease in the general population so when you become a doctor when you start working in the hospital i am 100% sure you will come across some of these cases and during that time remember this discussion you can diagnose this type of cases or even if you cannot diagnose but you can suspect and refer these to the specialist you have done the good job you know so this is the way now what are the presentation presentation means clinical features there would be episodes of bloody diarrhea or stools with mucus episodes of bloody diarrhea are stools with mucus very very important feature of inflammatory bowel disease because inflammation is going on inside the bowel bowel means intestine either small intestine or large intestine as a result of this mucus with blood in the stool will be passed there will be abdominal pain and this abdominal pain is towards the lower part of the abdomen and it is crampy in nature crampy means colicky colicky pain comes and goes okay off and on type of pain fever this fever is low grade because inflammation is going on and in severe inflammation fever is one of the symptom now according to the disease we may have a different type of features in case of crohn's disease cd is a crohn's disease we have different fistula around the anal canal and they are called peri anal fistula so let me ask you what do you mean by fistula yes okay okay i'll allow you okay can anyone tell me what is fistula you can answer now sir uh, it's abnormal connection between the two hollow uh, tubes very good abnormal connection between the two tubes very good okay and sometimes uh, it may not be between the two tube only uh, uh, the inner inner part is a tube and outer part is the outer part of the skin also okay very good so this is called fistula so now let me explain it once again there are lots of chance of fistula formation in case of crohn's disease now those fistula can occur between two loops of the intestine okay two loops of the intestine or it can occur between the intestine and outside means there is a one fistulous opening we can see from the outside as well and very very rarely in case of female okay sometimes the cases have been seen the cases have been reported there is a fistula tract which is connecting between the large colon large intestine or colon 
and vagina as well. Sometimes the tract is connecting between colon and urinary bladder as well. So these are a very you know complicated situation in case of Crohn's disease. Now extra intestinal manifestations are more common in ulcerative colitis than Crohn's disease. We'll talk about that a little bit later also. Probably may not be possible in today's class, but we'll again you know done this in the next class. Crohn's disease of the small bowel may present with malabsorption because the commonest site for Crohn's disease is terminal part of the ileum and ileum plays very important role in absorption of the food. Because of this single reason, malabsorption is quite common in Crohn's disease. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, it only affects the colon, the name itself, colitis. Only colon is involved, okay? Maybe the rectum or other part of the colon. That's why there is no malabsorption in case of ulcerative colitis. Now, one more point Crohn's disease may mimic appendicitis. Now, where is appendix located? Which is that anatomical region where appendix is found? Sir, in the lower. Uh... In the lower left part, uh, groin region. Okay. In the lower right, in the lower right groin. Yeah. Right, right groin region. Okay, it is on the right. Okay, right iliac fossa. You can say like that. It is called iliac fossa, and it is on the right side. So right iliac fossa. So this is the anatomical, you know, area. But if I go inside the abdomen, okay, it is present right there in the ilio. Lower right abdomen. Isn't it? Iliocecal region. It is present right there. Okay, it is present near the cecum area. Now, Crohn's disease also affects that site. That's why Crohn's disease and acute appendicitis are very common differential diagnosis. That is the meaning. Okay. Now, rather than going into the you know further slide, so let me show you uh, this one. And I'll start right from here in my next lecture because we have just one minute time now. Now see there, in Crohn's disease, okay, in Crohn's disease, almost whole of the GI tract may be affected, both large bowel as well as small bowel. It is uh, commonly said that mouth to anus is affected in Crohn's disease. Okay, oral cavity to anus, any part of our GI tract can be affected in Crohn's disease, whereas in ulcerative colitis, only the colon is affected. Now see there, okay, this is a very good picture actually, only the colon is affected. See here, so this is rectum, this is anal canal, this is sigmoid colon, this is descending colon, it may even involve the transverse colon, ascending colon till the cecum. So this is ulcerative colitis. In Crohn's disease, the lesions are skip lesion. See here, they are not continuous at all. This area is affected, then that area is affected. There is no continuity. This area is affected and this area is affected. There is a normal intestine in the middle. This is called skip lesion. Whereas in uh, ulcerative colitis, it is continuous. Okay, it is start from the rectum and going backward. Another is, this is, okay, let's start then. Okay. So we are talking about inflammatory bowel disease from the yesterday's class and let's continue. Today, I'll talk about the rest of the intestinal pathology, then I'll move on to the esophageal pathology. So yesterday we are talking about some of the clinical features of inflammatory bowel disease. Now, inflammatory bowel disease is mainly divided into two types, though some of the textbook mention three types, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Now, ulcerative colitis in clinical uh, you know, practice is a bit more or more common than Crohn's disease. Now, the common presentation are both of them can have bloody diarrhea or stools with mucus. Now, there is diarrheal stool. Okay, I'm sure all of you know what is diarrhea. Diarrhea means if the stool is okay, 
a uh, liquid type or watery with three or more times per day this is called diarrhea and another important sentence you need to add there is that stool takes the shape of the container which contains it okay that is diarrhea but in this case that diarrhea okay is mixed with blood this blood is because of inflammatory change which are going on in the bowel in ulcerative colitis that inflammatory change occurs in colon but in case of crohn's disease frankly speaking it occurs the whole gi tract but the commonest site is near the ileocecal junction okay the terminal part of the ileum is the most common site along with blood in the diarrheal stool there is lot of mucus as well now many of the patient presents with crampy lower abdominal pain or uh, a colicky pain in the abdomen they can present with fever also fever is a very common thing in case of inflammatory bowel disease and crohn's disease patient usually presents with perianal fistula yesterday also we talked about this the fistulation occurring between two loops of the bowel or between the bowel and other intra abdominal organ or even outside this is a very common uh, complication of crohn's disease extra intestinal manifestation are more common in ulcerative colitis than crohn's disease now what are those extra intestinal manifestation we'll talk about them a little bit later but some of them i want to take the name right now the very very important one which is always asked in your exam is primary sclerosing cholangitis it is involving the biliary channels inside the liver or even the bile duct okay we'll talk about them later let's uh, not mix all the things up together crohn's disease of the small bowel may present with malabsorption because the terminal part of the ileum is involved here and ileum is one of the major area from where absorption occurs and uh, crohn's disease may mimic appendicitis because the site for vermiform appendix and the site for Uh, the commonest site for crohn's disease are very near to each other one is terminal part of the ileum and another is present right there in ileocecal junction now let's differentiate between ulcerative colitis and crohn's disease so see there these are the important feature and uh, what are the differences between crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis now the most common site in crohn's disease is terminal ileum whereas in ulcerative colitis it's the rectum it always starts from rectum and goes backward that's why sometimes it is also known as okay <clears throat> backward colitis now distribution mouth to anus in crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis okay it is rectum to colon so back was ileitis so rectum to colon it is going towards the ileum but ileum belongs to small intestine that's why the name is given don't get confused actually ileum is not affected by ulcerative colitis only the colon is involved and colon means it's a large intestine okay so this is important point regarding the spread it is discontinuous in case of crohn's disease there are a lot of skip lesions in between okay it it just jumps there one area is affected uh then there is a gap then another area of the bowel is involved whereas in ulcerative colitis it's a continuous type of involvement regarding the gross features what happens when we examine uh, in crohn's disease there are focal ulcer with intervening normal mucosa that's why it is called a uh, skip lesion there is presence of fissure inside the bowel and the bowel wall is thickened now this thickening of the bowel wall is explained by transmural inflammation in case of crohn's disease now transmural means whole thickness of the bowel is affected and this is granulomatous inflammation so it it explains everything there whereas in ulcerative colitis there is extensive ulceration in colon and there is formation of pseudo polyp now this pseudo polyp are a very important feature okay 
in in ulcerative colitis now, one second okay it's a little bit of disturbance is coming so let me mute you right after some time i'll unmute you again fine now uh, regarding the pseudo polyp pseudo polyp means they are not the true polyp that's why the term pseudo so what are the form of them now remember in ulcerative colitis there is extensive inflammation and it's a chronic type of disorder so what happens there is a lot of granulation tissue which forms this granulation tissue hangs down towards the lumen and they almost look like polyp that's why they are called pseudo polyp one of the very important feature of ulcerative colitis now this picture i've already uh, shown yesterday but let's repeat again so this uh, these are the uh, skip lesion okay skip lesion in case of crohn's disease so let me highlight and show you Okay, see here, this is, uh, there is one lesion, this is uh, ileum, there is the appendix, so this is the terminal part of the, uh, so this is cecum I should say, this is terminal part of the ileum, there is appendix, so this is one part which is affected. Now this intervening part is normal, and again a little while proximal part is affected, another part is affected here, and another part is affected here. So there is a lot of uh, normal areas in between. This is called skip lesion. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, it starts from the rectum and goes backward. So continuously, there is no normal area in between. Now, another important point, this Crohn's disease involves the whole thickness of the bowel wall. It is called transmural inflammation. There's a lot of ulcer formation as well as fissure and fistula are also common in Crohn's disease. Those fistula can occur uh, between the two loops of the bowel, sometimes can occur between loops of the bowel and other organ, and sometimes between the bowel loop and outside as well. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, uh, look here, these are called pseudopolyp. So these are the ulcer, and in between also, this is granulation tissue which is hanging uh, towards the lumen. So this is called pseudopolyp. Now let's talk about uh, other differences between uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Now, regarding the microscopic feature, Crohn's disease is an example of non-caseating granuloma. It's an example of non-caseating granuloma. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, there is crypt abscess. Now crypts are the little bit okay a downward going areas in the mucosa so crypt abscess are seen in ulcerative colitis and non caseating granuloma in crohn's disease so when we talk about examples of granulomatous diseases or inflammation crohn's disease is one of the examples transmural versus mucosal and submucosal inflammation and regarding the complication crohn's disease has different strictures and this stricture can lead to intestinal obstruction. We already studied that before. If you take barium X-ray, okay, barium X-ray, there is a string sign seen on the terminal part of the ileum because that is most commonly involved. There is, there is a chance of intra-abdominal abscess formation. There is fistulization. There is formation of sinus tract, and there is very high chance of intestinal obstruction again in the terminal part of the ileum. These are common complication of Crohn's disease. Now in small uh, you know, explanation, sinus and fistula, there is a small difference between them. Fistula usually has opening on both sides, whereas sinus has opening only on one side, other end is blind. Now, regarding ulcerative colitis, the one of the very important complication is toxic megacolon. Now, this toxic megacolon is considered one of the emergency situation. 
because usually transverse colon is affected and that transverse colon is hugely dilated it may rupture any time and you all know if it ruptures it can lead to severe bleeding inside the peritoneal cavity the patient may die because of hypovolemic shock another important problem because of toxic megacolon is infection the infection can migrate from the colon into the blood now let's uh, let's see some of the pictures okay which will, which will explain uh, this topic further let me use a pointer and show you. you see here so this is colon isn't it ascending colon here is appendix there is a cecum this is ascending colon here is a transverse colon okay there is a descending colon this is sigmoid colon and here is the rectum and then when i go proximal from the cecum this is ileum okay this is ileum and these are the different loops of the small intestine now look at crohn's disease which parts of the bowel are affected even the colon are affected and small intestine are also affected so crohn's disease can affect any part of the alimentary tract whereas ulcerative colitis the small intestine is not affected only only the large intestine is affected that also from the rectum backwards rectum then backwards this is ulcerative colitis okay so let me unmute you okay, if anybody is uh, creating a little bit of noise they can unmute themselves if they don't then i'll mute everyone from here otherwise it will be a big noise for all of us now some more pictures regarding inflammatory bowel disease see this this is called a string sign this is barium x-ray which is showing a string sign so this area is very thin and this is because of crohn's disease of the terminal part of the ileum now you see here okay now these are the examples of pseudopolyp okay pseudopolyp now this is the uh, the colonoscopic examination of inflammatory bowel disease okay this is colonoscopic examination of inflammatory bowel disease it is ulcerative colitis now some more uh, important difference between crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis okay the left uh, over differentiate you can say regarding the genetic association of inflammatory bowel disease hla b27 has a very very important uh, connection with ulcerative colitis hla human leukocyte antigen b27 now if uh, this hla b27 is present in that person then that person may have ulcerative colitis and one other uh, disease if you can remember okay i'm going to tell you the name here that is ankylosing spondylitis okay ankylosing spondylitis is very commonly associated with hla b27 along with ulcerative colitis extra intestinal manifestation though it can occur in crohn's disease but it is uncommon but in ulcerative colitis it is quite common like arthritis peripheral arthritis involvement of the joint spondylitis means involvement of the vertebra and the spine pyoderma gangrenosum a very important uh, extra intestinal manifestation in ulcerative colitis that means the skins are affected and these skins are affected because of immunological reaction there is no infection going on here though the term pyoderma is here actually infection is not causing any problem okay you see that this infection is not causing any problem in case of pyoderma gangrenosum this is a mainly immunological problem sclerosing cholangitis i already told you sclerosing cholangitis is a very important extra intestinal manifestation in this 
those small uh, biliary channel or ducts are sclerose and they are obstructed. So the main feature is obstructive jaundice along with increased liver enzyme. Erythema nodosum can occur in the lower limb, especially on the anterior surface of the tibia. So these are very important ones. Apart from this, there is a cancer risk in inflammatory bowel disease more common in ulcerative colitis than Crohn's disease. In ulcerative colitis, the risk is almost 5 to 25 percent, okay? 5 to 25 percent, whereas in Crohn's disease, the risk is slight, about 1 to 3 percent. So, uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease can be a risk factor for colon cancer. Now, one small question before I move further. How we are going to treat a case of inflammatory bowel disease? Okay. Now, this, uh, uh, the pathogen, yes, yes, yes. You can answer this, anybody? Sir, we, uh, we can uh, use our tumor necrotic factor alpine. Mm -hmm. Zulfakar, yes. Sir, we can use tumor necrotin. Okay, fine. So in yes, yes, very good. Okay, so good. So we are, we are corticosteroid. Yeah, we are going to talk about that in medicine, but you know, you guys uh, are interested to know. That's why I'm just raising that question here. Okay, we are not going to ask those type of question in your exam because this belongs to pharmacology and medicine, but still. This is a good thing to correlate between pathological aspect and pharmacological or medical aspect. Now, this uh, type of disease are caused by immunological uh, phenomena. So we can use certain type of drugs which block immunological reaction like corticosteroids are important example here. Other immunosuppressive drugs are important example. Tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors are important example, okay? Monoclonal antibody, exactly. Monoclonal antibodies are important, and amino salicylates are important, like sulfa salazine, okay, and mesalazine. These are the important drugs. Now, with this, let's move on to another part of the discussion that is diverticula uh, in our intestine. Okay, so the first uh, among them is mycal diverticulum. Now, what do you mean by a diverticulum first? Now, diverticulum means, okay, now our colon or small intestine has got four layers, okay, four layers. Now, what will happen sometimes because of excessive pressure development or buildup inside the lumen, okay, some of the weak area in that wall is out pouching. It is going outward just like aneurysm. So, this is called diverticula. Some of these diverticula are congenital and some are acquired. One of the congenital diverticulum and the very, very important from the exam point of view is mycal diverticulum. So let's go in, going to talk about it, okay? Now congenital diverticulum, which is present in anti-mesentric border of the ileum, is called mycal diverticulum. See this, this is important point here. Okay, so this is present on the anti mesentric border of ileum. Now, ileum is a small intestine, and the, uh, the fold of the peritoneum which is supporting a small intestine is called mesentery. That mesentery is connected on one side, okay, but other side is free. So, we call that anti mesentric border, and in that anti mesentric border, this mycal diverticulum may be present. Now, if we uh, go and talk about embryological uh, structure, this is a remnant of vitelline duct. Vitelline duct is also known as umphalomesentric duct. Umphalomesentric duct. Now, what do you mean by that? This, uh, this Michaels diverticulum or this umphalomesentric duct is connected between midgut and umbilicus. Okay. Midgut and umbilicus. Now, from the midgut, small intestine is going to be derived, and umbilicus everybody know. So, 
this is a very important embryological structure. Now, Mikkel diverticulum has uh, a rule of twos. Okay, this is a uh, uh, very important from the exam point of view, and it will help us to memorize as well. So, these rules of twos tells us it is present in two percent of the general population. Two percent of the general population. So, we don't know who is having this Mikkel diverticulum until and unless they have some clinical features. They are two feet away from the ileocecal valve. So, two percent of the general population, two feet proximal from the ileocecal valve. Proximal is a better term here because it is present, you know, towards the ileum. Okay, not towards the colon, but towards the ileum. That is proximal uh, segment. Two feet means sixty centimeter. So, sixty centimeter above. It is. Two inch in length, and uh, around two percent of carcinoid tumor can occur in Mikkel's diverticulum. So these all are a rule of two, but these three, the first three, are more important than the last. So two percent of the normal population, a general population, two feet uh, proximal to the ileocecal valve, two inch in length, and two percent of carcinoid tumor can arise in. Mikkel diverticulum. Now, what can happen to the patient? Now, most of the Mikkel diverticulum are asymptomatic, so nothing will happen to the patient. Okay, nothing. Now, some of the patient, okay, may develop inflammatory feature that is called diverticulitis, and this diverticulitis. Can almost act like acute appendicitis. It almost act like acute appendicitis. Now, what will happen? This is very interesting. Okay, so listen carefully. Now, what will happen is the surgeon will open the abdomen. Okay, surgeon will open the abdomen, thinking that this may be a case of acute appendicitis. But the surgeon is very surprised to see the normal appendix, because appendix is normal here. This is. Uh, Mikkel diverticulitis, which is not present in the appendix area, so that time the surgeon uh, know that I need to check Mikkel diverticulum because that is the thing most of the surgeon will do. So what they do, they'll pull uh, slowly, okay, ileum from the incision site outwards, and around two to three feet proximally, okay, they reach and they check whether Mikkel diverticulum is present or not. If it is present, remember this. If it is present, even though it is not inflamed, they want to remove that as well, along with appendix, because it is of no use there. It can cause problem later on. So when they have this opportunity to remove together with appendix and Mikkel diverticulum together, they will always do that. Now apart from this, they also contain ectopic gastric mucosa. Now, ectopic gastric mucosa. Now, we all know ectopic means it's not present in the normal site. It is present outside the normal area. Normal site for gastric mucosa is stomach, but in this case, the gastric mucosa is present in the Mikkel diverticulum. Now, that gastric mucosa may secrete hydrochloric acid, and that hydrochloric acid can burn that mucosa. And can result in intestinal bleeding. That intestinal bleeding may come out into the stool as bright red blood, or a little bit dark blood. Okay, bright red. If the bleeding is heavy, if the bleeding is slight, it will alter because of the hydrochloric acid. So a little like bit like a coffee-colored blood can also come in the stool. So these are some of the very important feature. Of Mikkel diverticulum. Okay, now see there. I have collected some uh, pictures from your textbook. So let me show you. So this is uh, appendix. Here is the cecum. This is ascending colon. Okay, ascending colon. This is ileum. Okay, ileum. So Uh, uh, about okay, about two feet, okay, two feet proximal 
to the ileocecal junction okay this mucus diverticulum is present in this case it is shown about 1 meter okay 1 meter means 100 cm it is about 3 feet they are saying it's about 3 feet but remember the rule of 2 you don't need to change it okay remember rule of 2 it is present 2 feet proximal to the ileocecal junction now on this side mesentery is attached you can clearly see this is mesentery on the other side this is anti mesentery border so here is mucal diverticulum now this is a real pathological specimen okay real pathological specimen this is the mucal diverticulum which is out pouch okay it presents like this now after this let's talk about the acquired type of diverticula which are called colonic diverticulosis diverticulosis means multiple diverticula occurring together now they are acquired out pouching of the colon wall which are characterized by herniation of the mucosa and sub mucosa through the muscularis propria now what do you mean by that the mucosa and sub mucosa are going outwards through the muscularis propria that means only the mucosa and sub mucosa are out pouched not the uh, muscularis propria now let's think like this there is some defect or some some part of the muscularis propria are weak now so because of increased pressure inside the lumen the mucosa and sub mucosa are pushed outside through the muscle layer this is called diverticula and this is a acquired one now student may be confused here this muscularis propria means those two muscles which are present on the wall of the colon now, regarding epidemiology it's extremely common in the developed country because of their diet because of the fatty nature of the diet okay they have increased incidence of constipation and constipation is responsible for diverticulosis the incidence increases with age the risk factor i just now told you low fiber diet and fatty diet which leads to constipation and that constipation will lead to increase intraluminal pressure okay, inside the colon the most common location is sigmoid colon so this diverticulosis occurs mainly in the sigmoid colon now how the patient present what are the important presentation they are often asymptomatic okay now some of the patient may present with constipation or diarrhea But definitely constipation is more common now you may be wondering why diarrhea is written here now listen very carefully how long the patient can have constipation okay maybe few days maximum one week to 10 days now after that what will happen our colon okay has a lot of normal flora now those normal flora will start to act on this stool which is hard and which is collected there they will liquefy that stool and now that stool uh, okay will easily go downwards the stool will easily go downwards as a diarrheal stool but remember during that time there is lot of abdominal cramping pain or colicky pain because gas is also produced at the same time so the person is passing diarrheal stool a lot of gas will be collected in the abdomen which is causing pain and this is very very foul smelling stool because uh, this is degraded by those microorganisms which are present inside the colon at the same time some of the patient may have occult bleeding and iron deficiency anemia also occult means hidden bleeding which is not visible to our eye okay the stool is not red looking but if we analyze that stool under the microscope then rbcs are seen this is called occult bleeding or you can also call it ongoing slow type of bleeding and that can result in iron deficiency anemia and what type of anemia is iron deficiency anemia yes which type microcytic microcytic mm, anemia microcytic. very good okay excellent this is microcytic hypochromic anemia don't forget that microcytic hypochromic 
Microcytic means the size of the RBCs are smaller than the normal. Hypochromic means the color is also less. They look more pale. Now, another type of presentation in case of colonic diverticulosis is lower GI hemorrhage. Sometimes they may bleed massively and a lot of blood, red looking blood comes out in the stool. Now, complications of diverticulosis are diverticulitis, which is inflammation, okay, diverticulitis, inflammation, fistula, because these are outpouch structure. If diverticulitis occur in them, they can easily develop fistulization. Perforation and peritonitis is a very serious complication. Okay, now see here, these are colonic structure. Our colon is uh, filled by a stool and a lot of bacteria. If that stool and bacteria leak into the peritoneal cavity, within no time, that patient will develop peritonitis. This is the fecal or bacterial peritonitis. And this patient will develop septicemia and septic shock. There is high chance of death in septic shock. So this is a very serious complication. And the treatment of this is surgery, okay? Treatment of colonic diverticulosis is surgery, along with some symptomatic management. Now, with this, let's move on to the tumors of intestine now. Okay. What are the important points there? This is very important, you know, part of this lecture. Now, the tumors of the intestine are divided into benign and malignant. Now, polyp is also considered a type of growth there. So it is discussed under tumor. Now, what do you mean by polyp first? Okay, let's talk about this and then we'll move on to the, each of these one after other. Now, polyp is an abnormal growth of tissue which is projecting from a mucous membrane. Now, I like to, I like to differentiate polyp from diverticula. Okay, listen here, polyp. Okay, and diverticula look a little bit similar. Both are outpouching, but one is growing from the mucosa towards the lumen. Okay, growing from a mucosa towards the lumen. This is polyp. And diverticula always goes outwards from the wall of that a GI tract. That is the difference. They are not the same structure at all. Now, adenomatous colonic polyp means. These are the benign neoplasm of the colonic mucosa that has the potential to progress to colonic adenocarcinoma. Now, right now, they are benign. Okay, they are benign. That's why uh, we use the term adenomatous. Okay, I am not using the term carcinomatous anywhere. Adenomatous colonic polyp. They are the benign neoplasm of the colonic mucosa. Okay, which can develop into colonic adenocarcinoma. Now, this is a malignant one. Regarding the presentation, they are commonly asymptomatic, okay, asymptomatic, and they can bleed, can, can give rise to iron deficiency anemia. Okay, they can have occult bleeding and they can cause iron deficiency anemia. Now, some of the prognostic features of these uh, polypar Tubular versus villous histology means villous has a bad prognosis than the tubular one. The prognostic uh, features, okay, between uh, different uh, terms. Let's see here. Tubular versus villous histology. What is the meaning first? We should explain it. Villous has a bad prognosis than a tubular one. What is pedunculated and what is sessile appearance in case of polyp? What is the implication of size of the polyp and what is the implication of degree of dysplasia? Now, let me tell you some point right now. Now, it's already known. Villous histology has a bad prognosis than tubular. That means the villous type of polyp can transform into malignancy later on. Regarding the size of the polyp, bigger the polyp size, more chance of conversion into malignancy and more degree of dysplasia, more chance of conversion. These are quite easy terms. Now see here, let me explain what do you mean by these different terms.
so these are the normal these are the normal glands okay now see there now one of them okay has a stalk has a stalk and it is spreading like a rounded type of things in other word it looks like a tube okay tube so this is called tubular morphology tubular some of the polyp are like this and this is called peduncle because it has a stalk there stalk is called peduncle so this is pedunculated tubular morphology now on on the other hand see this these are finger like projection they look like villi so they are villus okay these are villus type of polyp and if they don't have stalk like this we call them sessile okay sessile means they don't have stalk pedunculated means they have stalk sessile means they don't have stalk so see there this is sessile okay here is pedunculated so these are tubular gland these are villus now this is tubular as well as villus this is the combination some of them are tubular some are villus so this is a real histological picture okay this is a schematic diagram but this is a real histological picture the down one this is tubular adenoma or adenomatous polyp you can say this is villus adenoma or villus papilloma is just another term and this is the combination tubulo villus adenoma now another schematic diagram is shown here these are the different pictures of adenoma this is pedunculated see this this is the stalk okay this is stalk is called peduncle and this is a tubular tubular morphology so pedunculated tubular now this finger like projections are villus and they don't have stalk there they have directly originated from the base so they are called sessile sessile villus so this is the meaning now with this let's move on to the familial adenomatous polyposis one of the very important uh, disorder in pathology what do you mean by that it is also known as adenomatous polyposis coli or apc this is a genetic condition okay or hereditary disorder which runs in the family it has a autosomal dominant inheritance and we all know autosomal dominant inheritance means it has a chance of 50% occurrence in every pregnancy 50% now the affected gene in this condition is apc gene okay adenomatous polyposis coli see this adenomatous polyposis coli gene which is present in chromosome number 5 this is q means long arm this is called locus so chromosome 5 okay or you can say long arm of chromosome number 5 this uh, apc gene is present then the person can have adenomatous polyposis coli disease now what happens in this person they can develop thousands of colonic adenomatous polyp inside the colon okay. many there are thousands this is a very important point so how do we diagnose probably if we examine this patients by colonoscopy because they are happening in the colon so we do colonoscopy this is a endoscopic examination of colon we can see this polyp and the diagnosis is certain even more than 100 adenomatous polyp can give us the diagnosis now the complication is important here by age 40 virtually 100% of this patient will develop an invasive adenocarcinoma 100% adenocarcinoma now let me explain further here so what lesson you have learned okay inside a family if one patient for example father is a patient of a uh, familial adenomatous polyposis okay and he died because of adenocarcinoma of the colon all children remember this all sons and all daughters must go to the hospital for colonoscopic examination to rule out whether they are having this disease or not because if they don't do that okay and if they if they don't know whether they are having this by age 40 all of them will develop adenocarcinoma 
And remember, colonic adenocarcinoma uh, is one of the very invasive malignancy. Prognosis is not that good. So this is a very, very important knowledge. Now, we have found out, for example, okay, diagnosis is done. You already know, by age 40, they will turn into malignancy and there is high chance of death. So can we do anything to prevent against that death or not? Yes, we can, okay? We have to sacrifice that whole affected segment of the colon. That is the only way to prevent against the development of colonic adenocarcinoma. So colectomy has to be done. Now, sometimes the whole colon may not be affected, okay? So whatever colon is affected, that colon has to be cut off and do end-to-end -end anastomosis. This is the way so that we can prevent them. But first thing is diagnosis. And how to diagnose? You have to suspect. If there is an important family history, you need to suspect them. Let's move on. Now look at this picture here. Okay, see here? Now this is a resected segment of the colon. Now see this, these all are polyp. These all are polyp. So you cannot even count them. They are innumerable. Okay, cannot even count them. This is a perfect picture of familial adenomatous polyposis or adenomatous polyposis coli. After this, let's talk about the last, uh, you know, important uh, part that is malignant tumor of colon. And colonic adenocarcinoma is the most important here. This is the third most common tumor in terms of incidence and mortality in the world. Okay. Very, very common, both in both sex, male as well as female. But uh, this uh, type of data keep on changing. So probably after a few years, it may not remain third. It may go up towards the second or go towards the fourth or fifth also. But just remember, it is one of the commonest tumor which kills the person and it is very common as well. Regarding the risk factor, older age are more affected and male gender are more commonly affected than the female. There is, there is a definite history of diet. Okay? Definite relation with the diet, I should say. Now, see here, what is that relation? High intake of fat, alcohol, or red meat they have a high chance of development of colon cancer because they will cause constipation. High intake of fat and red meat, okay? they will cause constipation, and alcohol can be a separate carcinogenic factor. Obesity, okay? smoking, and lack of physical exercise are some other risk factor. Now, I'm going to ask one question to you. What is the definition of obesity? Anybody? Yes, what is obesity? Sir, excessive fat. Uh, excessive <laughs> amount of fat in the body. Okay, excessive, excessive amount of adipose tissues. Okay. Anybody else? And yeah. so that fat has an adverse effect on his obesity, basically. Sir, uh, body mass index greater than 24. Are you sure it's greater than 24 only? No, sir, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the BMI greater than the borderline. I don't okay. remember. The okay, now, wait, 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 listen. Now, you know. No, sir, over the borderline is over, wait, after over the okay. Now, see there. Okay, this is an important knowledge. That's why I brought this point here. Okay, so let me uh, give you the answer right here. Now, see there, whenever we talk about BM, uh, obesity, we talk about BMI, body mass index. If this body mass index is okay, more than 30, never forget this. If body mass index is more than 30, we call it obesity. Now, normally, body mass index should be more than 18 and less than 24. More than 18, less than 24. Maybe up to 25, we can consider it's okay. In some of the textbook, it is written 18 to 25 also. Fine. This is normal. Now, between 25 to 30, what do we call that? There is still one range, 25 to 30. Okay? Overweight. Overweight. 
Wow. Very good. This is called overweight. Excellent. This is called overweight. It is already a little bit uh, worrisome, but still not in the obesity range. And if BMI is more than 30, this is obesity. Now, one other classification is also there. A BMI is more than 35. This is called morbid obesity. Morbid. Now, this patient is considered sick. Okay, this is a disease. Obesity is a disease. So these are some of the important points. So obesity itself is a risk factor in this cancer because uh, most of these patients, uh, according to their dietary history, they suffer from constipation. Now, low fiber diet, okay, low fiber diet is one important risk factor for colon cancer because it is also associated with constipation. Now, we all know what are the fiber containing diet. Vegetables and fruits are very rich source of fiber. That's why we should always include them in our daily diet and drink a lot of water as well. See here, diet which are low in fruits and vegetables. Apart from fiber, they also supply us antioxidant. And these days, these oxidizing substances play a big role in the causation of malignancy. So they provide us antioxidant. That's why fruits and vegetables are the must in our diet. Now, just now we talked about adenomatous polyp. It is one of the important risk factor because by the time, isn't it? By the time, another sentence is telling it, by the time there is 40 years, all these cases of familial adenomatous polyposis will develop colonic adenocarcinoma. Now, even if they have one or two adenomatous polyp, if that is of a big size and dysplastic, that can also turn into adenocarcinoma. And inflammatory bowel disease, okay, ulcerative colitis has 5 to 25% chance of conversion into colonic adenocarcinoma. So these are some of the important points. Okay, okay let's move on. Okay. Now please unmute yourself. Yes. Now, regarding the genetics, okay, of colonic adenocarcinoma, multiple mut mutations are involved. There may be presence of APC gene. This is adenomatous polyposis coli gene, the same uh, gene which was causing that condition where thousands of polyps are present in the colon. Presence of KRAS oncogene and P53 gene mutation, all of these are present for the causation of colonic adenocarcinoma. Now, regarding the morphology, now how it looks under the gross and microscopic feature, let's talk about it. Okay. One minute, let me mute, okay? Wait. Fine. Here. Regarding the morphology, this uh, uh, malignancy most commonly occur in rectosigmoid colon, cecum, and ascending colon. So rectosigmoid colon, cecum, and ascending colon. The most common is rectosigmoid junction or colon. Now, look at this picture. This is very important. Now, this is the picture of a colon. Okay, Here is the terminal part of the ileum. This is vermiform appendix. This is shikam, there is ascending colon, okay? This is called hepatic flexor. This is transverse colon. This is splenic flexor. This is descending colon. Here is sigmoid colon, and here is the rectum. So we all know this anatomy. Now, so see there, rectum, okay? Rectum is the most commonly affected site along with sigmoid colon. We call it rectosigmoid junction exactly at this area. It is very, very commonly affected. Another one is descending colon and other uh, places are quite rare. Now, let's talk about uh, what are the features of right-sided colon cancer versus left-sided colon cancer. Now, if we examine grossly the right-sided colon cancer, Okay, it is a polypoid mass. So we all know what is polyp now. So it is growing from the mucosa towards the lumen. It may be tubular, it may be villus. 
and regarding the common presentation it can bleed and because of this bleeding it can lead to occult blood in the stool which cannot be seen with our naked eye we need special types of examination to see this okay and over a period of time it can lead to iron deficiency anemia now let me give you one clinical scenario right now a 60 year old male came to the hospital with the history of prolonged constipation and on examination he is quite pale as well okay he is quite pale now the doctor did some physical examination other required physical examination okay and did some investigation during investigation he was diagnosed to have iron deficiency anemia he did all the tests which are necessary for iron deficiency anemia everything that came normal so because of his age the doctor thought about right sided colon cancer okay, this is the way we think in the hospital he did colonoscopy then the disease was diagnosed so right sided colon cancer may present as anemia in case of old people now what about left sided cancer then it can have okay napkin ring configuration now what do you mean by that napkin ring configuration now it is it is arising from all around and growing towards the lumen okay it is arising from all around the circumference of that part of the bowel and growing towards the lumen so that's why it can cause intestinal obstruction because there is a mass which is growing towards the lumen from everywhere it is not from one area it is from the circumference of the bowel and that is called napkin ring configuration so as a result of this it can cause obstruction very easy to understand but before complete obstruction it can change the configuration of the stool now listen it very carefully when that person passed the stool because of that narrow area okay at the center of the lumen of the bowel okay ribbon shaped stools will be passed the stool will change into ribbon shaped caliber and the person will be surprised in the beginning i didn't have that type of stool now is it really something wrong inside me that person may ask that type of question and may go to the doctor so this may be one of the presentation now another one if obstruction is a little bit severe the person will have constipation for few days let's say 5 6 7 8 or 9 days now after that again that stool will be liquefied by bacteria now it will turn into diarrhea that diarrhea is very foul smelling with lot of explosive gas formation so after some time again that neoplasm will grow okay that neoplasm will grow still so this is an alternative sort of constipation and diarrhea important feature of left sided colon cancer so there is change in bowel habit okay the person will have alternated constipation or diarrhea the caliber of the stool will change like a ribbon shape and there may be features of intestinal obstruction like absolute constipation vomiting abdominal distension and abdominal pain now see this slide okay this is let me use pointer and explain now this is fungating polypoid carcinoma okay fungating polypoid carcinoma what do you mean by that it is growing inside the lumen from the mucosa okay as a big polypoid mass this is very common in right sided colon cancer see here and the most common presentation is it bleed and uh, cause iron deficiency anemia whereas the left sided uh, colon cancer the left sided colon cancer can have napkin ring configuration 
exactly this is a very good a good picture here from all around the circumference of the bowel the mass is growing towards the lumen so it is causing obstruction of the lumen okay see here this is even better picture this is a real pathological specimen look at here this is a this is the lumen now it is very very narrow this is dilated but this is very narrow here so this is left sided colon cancer now there are few more pictures okay which are shown here let me explain them this is carcinoma of the cecum cecum comes on the right side so the fungating mass projects into the lumen but has not caused any obstruction because it is not coming from everywhere it is only present on one area of the cecum and the most common presentation it will bleed and can lead to anemia now on the other hand this is a carcinoma of the descending colon it is present on the left side so on the left side it usually has circumferential tumor like this okay yeah. the whole circumference of the colon has given rise to the tumor and it will lead to obstruction because it is a big mass there at the same time the center of the mass can ulcerate okay and it can also bleed a little bit but obstruction is the main problem of left sided colon cancer now some of the important points are still there what is the pattern of spread now where they go where where metastasis will occur now in the beginning the lymphatic spread occurs to the mesenteric lymph node okay it will occur to the mesenteric lymph node then the distant spread occur to liver lungs and the bone okay liver lungs and the bone now see here now one small question okay i have unmuted you all one small question why it goes to liver in the beginning why the metastasis goes to the liver who can answer this uh, sir uh, because of allergy photo circulation our blood goes to liver okay very good very good okay so this is a very easy question actually you just remember the uh, venous drainage of that part of the gi tract okay we are talking about the colon and the venous drainage of the colon will go to the portal vein and into the liver so the first important organ which is affected by metastasis is the liver now from the liver remember venous drainage of the liver will go to hepatic vein hepatic vein will drain into inferior vena cava and that blood will be taken into the right side of the heart from there it will go to the lung so lungs would be affected later on they will be affected definitely there is no doubt but they will be affected later on in very late stage all over the body okay the metastasis can spread now how to make a diagnosis now if that question is asked to you okay uh, a good student will answer we i will like to take a history i like to examine that patient and then only i'll move on to the investigation now some other student will jump into the investigation and their answer is only 50% right because they are completely forgetting about the importance of symptom and sign okay that's what we do all the time that is the first thing to do as a medical student and as a doctor never forget the importance of history taking and physical examination then only investigations are done so take a good history what is the main complaint of the patient why they came to the hospital then examine the patient thoroughly then only order the test so the test are barium enema now enema means you insert a tube into the rectum and then push the barium through the tube and take the x ray so you know what is exactly happening inside the colon this is one of the very important test another is endoscopic exam either sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy anything can be done it depends which part of the colon is affected okay. colonoscopy means the whole colon can be reached by colonoscopy sigmoidoscopy means only sigmoid colon can be examined if i examine 
uh, only uh, pro uh, rectum then it is called proctoscopy okay proctoscopy for rectum sigmoidoscopy for sigmoid colon and colonoscopy for whole colon with that i can examine what type of lesion is there and i can take biopsy also so this is a very very important investigation stool examination is done for done for occult blood because in right sided colon cancer occult blood is very common feature now we have come toward the end of this topic of intestinal pathology okay let's talk about carcinoid tumor now this is also important uh, types of tumor and in the beginning they are asymptomatic and when they are you know spread to the different organ you know they can kill the patient i'll give you one small uh, case scenario here one of my senior when i was working as an intern doctor when i was uh, like um, just like you guys a long time ago isn't it i st completed my study in 2001 then i joined uh, one of the hospital in rural part of nepal very good hospital though a lot of cases used to come there okay. i worked there for 2 years after my internship one year of house job i did there now i had a very good senior and that senior later on died okay later on he died of carcinoid tumor he was a very good doctor that time he even went to foreign countries uh, for the treatment but nothing could save him so this is carcinoid tumor so pay attention what do you mean by this this is a neuroendocrine tumor which often produce serotonin you can also call it serotonin producing tumor now the commonest site okay of its origin is appendix and another site is terminal part of the ileum so appendix and terminal part of the ileum but in the exam this question can be asked very commonly what is the most common site of origin of carcinoid tumor appendix is the answer now from appendix through the portal vein okay from appendix through the portal vein it will reach the liver now in the liver this malignancy will grow it will become very big in size and it can release a lot of serotonin now this serotonin can cause a lot of clinical feature in our body and this is called carcinoid syndrome so carcinoid syndrome are the problems created by serotonin and this serotonin is secreted by carcinoid tumor now see here what are these the person can have diarrhea because of increased peristaltic movement and abdominal cramp as well this is called abdominal pain the person can have cutaneous flushing okay cutaneous flushing means the the superficial blood vessels on the skin are dilated okay they develop telangiectasia telangiectasia means dilated superficial blood vessel so that can be there and that is also uh, uh, you know by serotonin bronchospasm and wheezing this is the effect of serotonin in our airway so they narrow the airway and the person can have wheezing now wheezing is a musical sound when somebody breathe the effect in the different systemic you know organ or arteries will be fibrosis systemic fibrosis and one of that main organ is the heart okay now listen very carefully here now where this serotonin will go from the liver where it goes first to the hepatic vein isn't it it goes first to the hepatic vein from hepatic vein it will go to the inferior vena cava then it reaches right atrium okay then into the right ventricle so the first two heart valve which comes in contact with the serotonin are tricuspid valve and pulmonary valve so let me uh, you know highlight and explain to you here so see this tricuspid valve and pulmonary valve are the first two valve which comes in contact with the serotonin so with the effect of serotonin they become thick and five rows so these are the two valve which are very commonly affected in carcinoid heart disease see here carcinoid okay heart disease so this also 
is a common question which can be asked to the students. Now, how the diagnosis is done? The diagnosis is done by okay, a measuring the metabolite of serotonin in the urine. This is 5 hydroxy indole acetic acid, and the level is very high in the urine in this type of disorder. Now, one, one point I like to mention here, probably students want to know, is cutaneous flushing in the skin is called telangiectasia. Okay, so write the spelling telangiectasias. These are important uh, pathological term. This means superficially dilated blood vessels. Now, at the end, okay, uh, uh, I have uh, compiled some questions for you.